Uh, dear all, welcome to this uh, NephroTube webinar. It's my pleasure and honor to present my uh, dear friend, Dr. Salil Kateb, renal specialist, Leicester Hospital, UK. She will present today one of the most important uh, topics that uh, we all meet in our dialysis units, intradialytic complications. Please, Dr. Sally. Can you hear me well? Yes, I can hear you well. Okay. Um, welcome, everybody. Thanks for the very kind introduction, uh, Dr. Gawad. Um, I have the pleasure today to uh, discuss a very common topic. I think for all nephrologists, whatever your grade is, I think you would come across complications of hemodialysis. Um, next slide, Dr. Gawad, if that's okay. So as we could see this um, lovely lady sitting chilled and looking like she's having a great time on dialysis, but unfortunately this is not how it works all the time. My agenda today is intradialytic complications, which are patient related, and then we'll move on to technical related issues. I'll focus on recognizing and managing most complications and we'll have a little quiz to apply the knowledge at the end. Please stop me if you need me to repeat or if anything is unclear. And then at the end of the webinar, we're gonna make space for questions. So patient related complications, I think one of the very common ones is hypotension. Um, then it comes hypertension, which is less common, mm, muscle cramps, disequilibrium syndrome, which has become less now that we've become better in understanding how to gently dialyze our patients. And then a bunch of symptoms which appear very common and could be not related to the dialysis necessarily, but we do come across nausea, vomiting, headache, chest pain, itching, chills, and fever. Next slide, please. So the technical problems we face are clotting, hemolysis, air embolism, dialyzer reactions, blood leak, severe blood loss, or even power failure. Obviously, they are not common, but we must learn about them. Next slide, please. So bleeding and access complications, I'll start with that. Now, apologies. Actually, I decided that for bleeding and access complications, um, if Dr. Abdel Gawad agrees, this is, should be a separate session because it will take an hour on its own. So maybe next time we could um, dwell on to that. So common complications, again, these are in percentages. Um, I will not repeat myself, but the very common ones are hypotension and cardiac arrhythmias, cramps, nausea, vomiting, and then the rest come in percentages from five to 10, chest pain, back pain, headache, itching, and fever. So what is intradialytic hypotension? Do we have a definition? Um, we don't have a specific definition. It depends on which guidelines you're using, whether it's the knife, whether it's the Kidigo or the renal association one. Um, I think that I find the renal association definition makes more sense to me um, because it defines intradilytic hypotension to any drop in systolic blood pressure that causes symptoms, which makes sense because every patient is different. And as we all know, we the patients present nausea, vomiting, dizziness, cramps, um, altered consciousness, dark vision. These are all symptoms consistent with low blood pressure. And this is why we strictly monitor blood pressure every 30 minutes. 
what are the associations with intradilytic hypotension? When do we actually worry about a patient from intradilytic hypotension? So all of our patients are diabetic, most of them. Most of them have a high cardiovascular um, risk disease. And the reason is most of our patients, by the time they start dialysis, they have so many um, heart problems and um, macrovascular and microvascular complications. For some reason, females suffer more from intradialytic hypotension. Expectedly, it's associated with low albumin and poor nutrition, autonomic neuropathy. And this makes common sense because even when you're diabetic or you have a cardiovascular disease, you lose the autonomic um, control of your vessels. So you cannot sort of constrict to compensate for this hyperdynamic dialysis um, treatment. And this is why uh, we therefore end with people having intradialytic hypotension, uh, advanced age, severe anemia, uh, large interdialysis weight gain. And this is, um, I think, the story of our lives as nephrologists. Um, we cannot manage to get patients to um, minimize fluid intake, um, which is very common, I think, everywhere all over the world. Next slide, please. Thank you, Dr. Abdegoa. So causes of intradialytic hypotension, again, I won't be repeating myself, but if we think of the physiology of what's happening, you get huge blood volume changes. You could get lack of vasoconstriction due to a weak heart muscle. The concentration of calcium in the dialysate in some units could be a little bit too low, and that causes hypotension. Eating shortly before dialysis or even during dialysis is not a good idea because all the blood goes to your gut and you end up with very, very um, high risk of hypotension during the session. Another very common one is the antihypertensive medication. Sometimes we forget about looking into the days of dialysis. If a patient is suffering from intradialytic hypotension, we should omit the doses or at least tailor them uh, based on the patient's blood pressure and stop some of them just from the days of dialysis. So if the ultrafiltration rate is more than the refill volume, then obviously your blood pressure will drop. So the advice would be intradialytic weight. So the weight a patient puts on between two sessions should be a max of two kilograms between sessions and no more. This comes to 10 to 13 mils per kg per hour, roughly. So we always instruct the nurses to try and aim for half a kilo per hour. Sometimes they could actually remove more, um, but this is going, the ideal would only be like half a liter per hour. How do we manage intradialytic hypotension? How, at least, how do we sort of minimize the risk of it? I think a prophylactic approach is better than waiting for the patient to suffer from low blood pressure. So the first thing and the most important is to avoid the cause, which is minimizing the interdialytic weight gain by patient education. And I appreciate that we all do our best and sometimes it doesn't work because it's hard. So you are asking the patient, to limit sodium intake, to avoid excessive fluid intake as well, avoid any food that has sort of, you know, the preservatives, um, any high uh, salt potassium diet. So it's quite hard to be consistent with that. From our end, we need to slow the ultrafiltration rate as a form of gentle dialysis so that we're withdrawing the fluid very, very gradually. 
and we are allowing for compensation for, for these hopefully bouncy vessels to constrict and compensate for the process of removing uh, fluid. Again, avoid the intradilatic uh, food. Um, but then if we look at dialysis specific tricks we could do, the very common one we all do is drop the dialysate temperature. So um, every unit has its own number. I would say it's usually 36, 35.5, which is a pretty um, cool temperature. So this is why many patients would say, I feel very cold during the session. And then the other thing we could do is use medicine. So the very common one we use is midodrine. Now, does midodrine work for all patients? It can help. But because most of the patients lose the, um, they, they have sort of the autonomic neuropathy conditions and they're diabetic. So midodrine will not work because the way it works is it will vasoconstrict your vessels, which doesn't really work if you have autonomic neuropathy. So this is something we should think about. Some people use fludrocortisone and sometimes it works, especially if you have a low aldosterone. Again, L-carnitine therapy, which is not commonly done. And then there is a, some data about sertraline, which I suggest um, you could read at your own pace. Next slide, please. Thank you. Intradialytic hypotension acute setting. So this is for the more uh, junior level. If you know nothing about the patient, nothing about dialysis, and you come into a room, patient is suffering from low blood pressure. The nurses have done all the tricks, but the blood pressure is low. So what do you do? ABC, you stop the HD, you stop the session, just instruct the patient, the, the, the nurse, say stop the session, stop the um, session completely. Um, turn the patient into the Trend Lindbergh position and give IV fluids within reasoning, but you need to give IV fluids. And don't forget that if you do all this and the patient's blood pressure does not pick up, to exclude very common causes of intradialytic hypotension. I rephrase that, not common, but dangerous, and we could lose picking it up on time. So think bleeding. Is the patient bleeding from anywhere? You will be doing the exposure anyway when you go through your A, B, C, D. So when you expose the patient, you're gonna check for any bleeding, you're gonna check for any sepsis, is he tachycardic, is um, he having rigos, is he having high temperature? And think of pericardial effusion as well. So preventative measures, I'm repeating myself here. Um, the only two points I put this slide because I want to mention two things actually. So apart from cooling the dialysate and avoiding low calcium dialysate um, and giving midodrine and obviously chemo dye filtration, which in our hospital is, is the one we, we do. We're not doing in like sort of conventional hemodialysis where now most of the patients are on hemo dye filtration because it's uh, more gentle. Again, if we're not familiar with types of hemodialysis, um, we could discuss this in a separate session. But just a brief thing to know is that hemodye filtration is more gentle than the standard hemodialysis. The two things I'd like to say is, we used to do a lot of sodium profiling in the past. I am not a fan of sodium profiling because um, on the long term, you are basically exposing the patient to a lot of sodium and it will fire back. So what is sodium profiling? And just simply, you increase the sodium concentration in the dialysate 
so that you are able to remove more fluid at the beginning of the session without the blood pressure dropping. So you will suck more fluid, but at the same time, the sodium is going to the patient. And if we think of how it works, yes, you will get more fluid out of the patient, but by the time the patient comes back to you with more sodium concentration in his blood, he will be very thirsty and he will drink a lot of water and that will just make you lose what you've done. So it's kind of like something that would temporarily please you, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, it doesn't work very well. I know that some units still do sodium profiling and obviously it would be nice to hear about your experiences at the end of the talk. The other one is UF profiling. So using the fact that the urea is high at the beginning of dialysis, so you set the machine to remove more fluids at the beginning of the session so that the refill rate will be high. And then as the urea concentration falls down, you are removing less fluids. It's just a bit of physiology we need to think about. Next slide, please. What do you tell your patient? So again, you tell the patient to decrease their weight gain, to limit the sodium, to limit the fluid. Um, you can use the fact that the patient still has residual function and increase the dose of the loop diuretics so that you're squeezing them to use their own residual kidney function to get rid of fluids. I'd like to remind us of this beautiful machine here, the body composition one. This is, um, there's the sort of a standing one and a portable one. Uh, we use it all the time. Again, it would be interesting to uh, share your experiences with, with this machine. It's a good one, but it's just a machine. So it does tell you how much fluid excess fluid the body has, your flesh weight with all the distribution all over your body compartments. But I would suggest that just rely on your gut feeling, on your clinical sense, because these machines are designed, um, it's sort of like they should fit all sizes, but, but it doesn't work like that because you have very tiny patients and then you've got bigger patients. So if you're too tiny or if you're too big, these machines are not very helpful. They're not accurate. Um, they are more accurate for ideal patients who have average weights. Shall I carry on everyone? Because I'm moving on to intradialytic hypertension. Yes, you can move Is my on. voice clear, Dr. Gawad? Yes, yes, it is clear. And we can leave the questions uh, at the end of the lecture, Joel. Okay, so intradialytic hypertension. If systolic blood pressure is increased more than 10 mm uh, mercury, then the systolic blood pressure is considered uh, as, you could define it as intradialytic hypertension. The incidence is not very common, 5 to 15%. It is associated with a high mortality. But again, it is not something we really know how to deal with. Um, the causes are uncertain. It's all sort of theories. One theory suggests that when you remove too much fluid and you do quick ultrafiltration, then if your autonomic system is working properly, um, then your sympathetic system starts sending messages and your vessels constrict. Um, you get a little bit of uh, tachycardia. So then that increases the cardiac output and you end up with intradialytic hypertension. If you are in a positive sodium balance as well, that could cause intradialytic hypertension. Um, the one I would go for, uh, which really makes sense, is the stimulation of the RAS system and the sympathetic nervous system. And this is why my advice would be, if you have no high potassium issues or allergies, think of switching your patients to ACE and ARBs the patients that are on dialysis. So I try and avoid 
you know, calcium channel blockers, um, I don't think they're very helpful in this cohort. And I try and switch patients to ACE and ARBs uh, to um, inhibit the RAS system. Next slide, please. I would like to pause here because I personally forget this a lot. So what is like, how would you think about intradilytic hypertension and your choice of medication? You have to think broadly. So I am not just going to treat the hypertension during dialysis. I have to think of the patient like as a whole. So if the patient, let's say has heart failure and he's got a low ejection fraction, it would be nice to give him carbidolone. If the patient's suffering from AF, for example, then beta blocker would be a good choice. And so on, um, prostate problems, uh, alpha blocker. Uh, some patients who are on PD treatment, tummy dialysis and have residual function, you would give ACE and ARBs because actually it protects the residual uh, renal function. More importantly, are blood pressure tablets dialyzable? I think it is something we forget about. And um, this is a very neat table here um, about the percentage of re removal of commonly prescribed antihypertensive drugs. I think it would be pretty boring if I go through all of them, but you can take a snapshot and put it on your phone because it almost mentions most of the common ones we use, the percentage of removal of the drugs so that for example, let's just use one example. Um, if we go to a dialyzable one, it would be lisinopril, surprisingly. So imagine if you're giving a patient lisinopril before dialysis and you forget that 50% is washed off. So the patient will suffer from high blood pressure or is likely to suffer from high blood pressure. ARBs are better, angiotensin receptor blockers, because almost none of them are dialyzable. The losartan, the candesartan, the uh, telmisartan, herbisartan, all those are non-dialyzable. And then you can have a look um, at the beta blockers. The one that is very highly dialyzable is the metoprolol. Uh, reassuringly, the amlodipine that we all use is not dialyzable at all. Moving on to, so now we've done the blood pressure, we've done the high and we've done the low. Let's move on to something else. So muscle cramps. Muscle cramps are very common. And the main causes for muscle cramp would be decreased blood pressure, decreased volume, um, and all that happens because we're trying to um, ultrafiltrate a lot of fluid from the patient. So this makes the perfusion to your muscles very poor. And then you've got all the electrolytes abnormalities, the low magnesium, low potassium, and low calcium. So how do you prevent and manage? Obviously, treat all the causes. Make sure that... Make sure that all the electrolytes are in check. So always check electrolytes for patients. And if you want to give fluid, then hypertonic glucose would be better than saline. And you could go and read about that. Um, stretching programs can be helpful. Increasing the sodium concentration in the dialysate within limits not to an extent that you would overload the patient. And I'm not here talking about sodium profiling. I am just saying increasing the concentration of the sodium in the dialysate until uh, this problem subsides. Increasing the magnesium con you know, concentration because um, many patients have magnesium deficiency, especially the PD patients. And then coming to medication, we all know the common one, which is quinine sulfate. Most patients are on quinine sulfate. And then there's the vitamin E, L, carnitine. But again, they're not commonly used, but they are um, approved. 
The third one would be arrhythmias. I just want us to get out of the box of dialysis here and just imagine that these patients are just normal patients. They're, he, yes, they are dialyzing, but they could get arrhythmias due to coronary artery disease, pericarditis, anemia, advanced age. Um, so you just have to deal with arrhythmia as in general medicine. What are the causes of arrhythmias? Next slide, please. Again, nausea vomiting is a very common one. It's associated with hypotension. So when the patient's blood pressure drops, they feel very nauseous. Um, it could be an early manifestation of disequilibrium. And this is one we sometimes forget about. So just keep it at the back of your mind, early manifestations of disequilibrium. Uh, it could be a dialysis reaction. It could be gastroparesis in the diabetics. Um, and less likely contamination from increased dialysis, calcium, and sodium. Um, I think we're better in this now. So how do we manage? You obviously treat the blood pressure, low blood pressure by giving IV fluids, ABC. You give antiemetics, which is just common sense, and you try and prevent what happens. If you think that the low blood pressure is not Sorry, if the nausea vomiting is not related to the low blood pressure, you could go for metoclopramide pre-dialysis. Uh, I think we prescribe it here for many of our patients, dialysis patients, as a PRN. Um, sometimes they need to have it every session. Headache. So again, headache is an early sign of disequilibrium. And what I find you know, very interesting is most of the dialysis unit, they deprive the patients from coffee because of high potassium. And being a coffee addict myself, I appreciate that if you just stop the patient from having coffee for long hours, or even get rid of the caffeine through the dialysis machine, then the patient is likely to get headache. Um, so I would say, I sometimes tend to give some patients who don't really have high potassium issues, a cup of caffeine just before the session starts, and it does help, along with paracetamol. And then um, please, let's not forget that again, the dialysis patients are just like any normal patient. If the headache is very severe, then you need to think of all the neurological causes. Chest pain, I think this is too basic. But anyway, chest pain would happen due to a dialyzer reaction, anginal pain, pericarditis, air embolism, and hemolysis. Next slide, please. Itching is a very common one, and I don't think we have a quick fix for it, and I don't think there's a, a good solution. But let's think. If you're having itching, what is the timing of the itching? Is it only during dialysis or is it between dialysis sessions? Because I think if it's between dialysis sessions, then we're looking into um, addressing secondary hyperparathyroidism and trying to improve the efficiency of dialysis because you, your patient is itching due to lots of toxins accumulating and your patient is possibly itching because of high phosphate. Um, and again, bone mineral disease and CKD is another topic. If your itching is happening just during the session, so you might as well think of more acute things like a dialyzer reaction. Um, it is less common nowadays with um, all the like sort of biocompatible membranes available, but you still need to think about it. Or maybe your patient is sensitive to heparin. So this is why they're itching during dialysis. So either during or in between. If it's during, you could do things like changing the dialyzer itself. Obviously, I, I appreciate it's not an easy thing to do in, you know, an easy thing to do in all units. But if you think it's because of a dialyzer reaction, then you could change the type of dialyzer to a more physiological biocompatible one. What are the common things we do for patients? Obviously, uh, moisturizing, oil bath, antihistam antihistaminic. The things that work better are probably, we would all agree that gabapentin is doing a good job, pregabalin, and then less commonly UVB, oral charcoal, which 
have not heard to be used in clinical practice, to be honest. Uh, tacrolimus and naloxone. What is the best treatment? As always, kidney transplant. Disequilibrium syndrome. Um, if we go back to basics, um, I hope I'm not boring everyone on the call, but I like starting from very uh, sort of basic level. So what is disequilibrium syndrome? Kidneys are not working, urea piles up, and because the urea in the blood is pretty high, at the beginning of the dialysis, you are removing the urea. So if we think of the osmosis, the urea now in the blood is becoming less. So the osmotic pressure is less in the blood. Then you've got all the brain cells, the osmos osmotic pressure, the ability of the brain cells to suck fluid from the vessels become, becomes higher. So the fluid passes on from the blood to the brain cells, making them edematous and swelled up. So it's just due to the difference of osmosis between the bloodstream and the brain cells. This is why you get disequilibrium syndrome. It could start, as we mentioned before, by early nausea vomiting, and then it could obviously go up to serious seizures, coma, hopefully not to an extent of death, but it could happen if ignored. I don't personally see lots of disequilibrium syndromes because now we have a protocol that we dialyze uh, people initially just for two hours, for two or three sessions. And this means that we are not dropping the concentration of urea abruptly. Again, you think it's disequilibrium syndrome and you just wanna do something to save your patient? Decrease the blood flow if it's mild, decrease the UF, most of us will just stop the hemodialysis session. I don't think I'd be brave enough to do anything. I'll just stop the session and reassess. If you want to avoid it in future, as I mentioned, we need to avoid aggressive dialysis treatment. Aggressive means long hours and high flux dialyzers. So usually, um, we choose them based on the patient's size, but when you start dialysis, if a patient has never had dialysis before, you should avoid aggressive treatment. And this, I think, is standard in all units. And obviously, avoid decreasing sodium dialysate too much. And it is for the very same idea, because when you decrease the sodium dialysate very much, you again will invite fluid to the brain cells due to the difference in osmotic pressure. Hemolysis, so that is serious. Um, again, it's nice to hear from everyone how common this happens. So hemolysis, it could be mechanical due to a kink, a small needle or a high pump speed. It could happen due to dialysate issues. So obviously contamination, no matter what you do, by the way, um, I don't think we are able to meet the guidelines in all units. So contamination is an important one. Um, obviously if your dialysate has a high temperature that could cause hemolysis. The other one is a problem with water supply, too much copper, zinc, nitrate, or chlorine and fluoride. Next slide, please. How does a patient present when they have hemolysis? I think we would all know that from basics again, chest pain, back pain, shortness of breath, and a very um, diagnostic one would be, if you look at the venous lines of the dialysis machines, uh, the blood is quite dark. And if massive, please think of high potassium because hemolysis will cause high potassium and your patient is likely to arrest. So what are we gonna do? ABC, stop the blood pump, clamp your blood lines, get rid of the blood, don't give the, the blood back. 
because it's full of potassium, treat hyperkalemia, and obviously this patient is going to be hospitalized. It's a medical emergency. Air embolism. Air embolism is very, very rare because we do have an air detector and an air clamp in the machine, but mistakes do happen. So you could get, for example, someone putting the arterial line, you could get some air in through the arterial line. Maybe the pre-pump arterial line is open or may maybe even your line, the dialysis line is not um, cuffed properly. So sometimes when you put the cap, you just need to make sure that the cap is tight enough. Because what will happen, the air will migrate, it will just migrate anywhere, and it really depends where it goes. The symptoms happen depending on the organ. So for example, if it goes to the lung, you'll get cough and dyspnea, brain, it, you could have convulsions and uh, sadly coma. How do you treat that? You clamp the blood lines, you stop the blood pump, and you lie the patient in the left lateral side, give them 100% oxygen, and let's remember CPR, I think. Um, so you, you um, it's, it's a very, very serious uh, complication. There are lots of tips on how you would minimize air embolism when you insert and remove lines, but it's not the time to talk about that. Dialyzer reactions, so type A, type B. We have type A and type B. Uh, this is what a dialyzer looks like. It was called at some point first use syndrome. What is type A? Type A, just so that we don't, you know, I, I don't want to crowd your brain. So type A, it happens very quickly in the first five minutes, five to 10 minutes. Uh, the symptoms are pretty moderate. So patient feels itchy, they sneeze, they cough, they could get nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. So sort of poorly symptomatic, uh, but the patient is just not well. Um, and they could even arrest sometimes. Causes. So the cause is the ethylene oxide allergy um, used for cleaning the machines. AN69 plus ACE inhibitor. So this is a bit um, too detailed. Uh, so to avoid confusion, it's just a type of dialyzer and patients who are on ACE inhibitors who are dialyzing with dialyzer having AN69 are likely to have the type A reaction because the combination of both increases the bradykinine and bradykinine causes reaction. And finally, bacterial contamination. Managing is by avoiding all the risks that lead to this. And as I mentioned before, changing the dialyzer to a biocompatible membrane is the best solution sometimes. Then we've got the type B. So this is more sort of a slower process. Um, it starts over roughly more than 30 minutes. So the main question you would ask a nurse during a session when called, so they bleep you, you come as a renal reg, they will just say, you know, the patient's unwell. So the first thing you should ask is, when did the patient become unwell? When did the patient start dialysis? Because this tells you a lot. It differentiates between type A and type B. Um, mild chest pain, it's kind of like a milder. So type B is generally uh, milder. The cause is unknown. And when nephrologists are stuck and when we don't have a proper answer, we blame the compliments, but nothing is certain. Again, you could change the dialyzer to a more biocompatible. So, um, I think um, by type B, I have finished the slides. Um, I will stop there, but I would like to get you guys to apply any knowledge, if any, you picked up from this session, 
and please spend a minute or two to read the question and then we will uh, maybe get the answers on the chat box just to make it a little bit more interactive and Dr. Gawad will help us with the, the right answer and then we will explain why. It's a very simple question and I think um, no pressure but most of you will know the answer. I just wanted to to feel that I've achieved something from the session and I want you to get it all right. Okay, so we are waiting. Uh, yeah, read the, the read the case, and I will show you the question, and then you will answer in the chat box. Uh, this is a thirty-five year old indigenous uh, patient uh, presents with a three month history of episodes of sweating, palpitations, and muscle cramps during the second half of the dialysis session. He was on maintenance hemodialysis for the last eight months with a conventional dialysis regimen of three hemodialysis sessions per week, each cycle for four hours. Interdialytic would gain 1.5 to 2 kilos. Despite the initial reduction of ultrafiltration volume avoidance of antihypertensive medication on the day of dialysis and sodium profiling, the patient remained symptomatic. Ork ruled out any cardiac issue to be the cause of, the, of his symptoms. What further measure would be appropriate for the patient in order to reduce the episode of intradialytic hypotension? Waiting your answers in the chat box. Is it one, two, three, four, or five? Most of them uh, go with uh, five, and we have uh, Dr. Maro answered for two. So the, uh, the answer is uh, Sally between two and five. What is your comment? Hello, sorry, I lost you, Dr. Gawad. Did you? Uh, uh... The, the answer is between two and five. Two and five. Yes. So in the chat box, can we please share why you chose two and then why whoever chose five chose five? Yeah. Just to help us. Yes, explain learn. your answer. Just explain your answer. We are not getting any responses. Uh, Sally, you can comment on uh, the answers, uh, please. We have an answer that uh, reducing the dial Z uh, temperature, temperature is vasoconstrictor or has a vasoconstrictor action. Again, most of the answers are going with uh, number five. Why? Because patient not gain too much weight and low temperature lead to vasoconstriction. This is one of the explanations that the patient is not gaining much weight between uh, hemodialysis. There is no much intradialytic weight gain. That's why they are choosing number five. Sally? Dr. Sally? Dr. Sari, you lost your you lost your connection. We lost you. I 
it seems uh, that we lost Dr. Sari. I will continue till she returned. Oh, okay, I didn't mute you. You, mute, you muted yourself. I didn't mute you. I will open the mic for you again. I will request. Uh, wait. I asked you to unmute. Please un unmute yourself. Okay, that's okay. better. Can you yes. hear me now? Yes. Amazing. So let's move on to the next question, please. So the answer is five, right? Right? Or your communicator? Yes. Okay, it's a five. Because the patient is not getting much weight between the dialysis sessions. Okay, the next question. And the second, the second question, and we will have also uh, multiple choice after it. This is a case of... There is... Um, ah. So if I... I apologize for that, but uh, after you read question two, if we uh, flick to the next slide, because the rest of the information is next to the answers. So, and the, I think it's important to know all the information complete. So, can so let's it. spend two minutes, we two minutes read. just to okay. read it. I will give two minutes for them to read it. Then I will go for the next slide, to the next slide. Okay, I will go to the next slide. What is your answer? So if we just spend a moment reading the little box here, because it's very important that uh, the pre-dialysis weight was 62. The target weight, 61.5. But the nurse asked the doctor, how much should I UF? And the doctor said three liters. The pre-dialysis blood pressure is 135 over 90 and the current is 90 over 60. So let's think about this extra piece of information. And the answer is here. What's the immediate next step? I just want us to think of the immediate step, not the second step, the immediate step, which is, I'm sure all of you would do. So what is the appropriate immediate next step? Thank you, Mohammed. I think we're starting to um, Fatima. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Ali Azhar. Okay, and Hannah, Dr. Hannah. Amazing. I think when I stressed on the immediate next step, we all said infuse IV fluids. Prior to that, you all opted for reducing UF, um, stopping UF. I mean, all this is correct. You will stop UF, but there's no answer here as stop UF, but there is infuse IV fluids. Um, can someone unmute themselves and explain the answer? Um, just to make it more interactive, who would like to explain why they chose their answer?
If not, we can move on. Okay, we can go for the next question. What to do after ABC? Um, I apologize. Can mm -hmm. we delete this slide because I didn't think we will have more, you know, time for more questions. So this was, um, I just had more questions. So if we just ignore this slide and ignore this slide as well, apologies. This was more questions. Okay. So I just want to mention that this was a, a very basic session and uh, my references are just from the handbooks. So this book is really, really um, simple. Not, not, I mean, not simple is the word, but if you um, kind of try to flick through it rather than memorize it, Handbook of Dialysis Therapy. And then my other reference is in the second slide. Can we move on to sit next slide? Again, uh, the Handbook of Dialysis. Uh, I think you should all have these books if you're looking into uh, sub-specializing in dialysis. Next slide. Now I made a, some suggestions. Um, I always like leaving the session with some topics that we could explore. So sodium profiling is one, bioimpedance machines and reading about it. Reading about dry weight in dialysis patients because it's always a trial and error. Um, it would be interesting to read about the trials for treating uremic pruritus, um, types of biocompatible uh, membranes. Uh, there is you know, a lot going on, especially over the last three, four years. So it'd be nice to read about them. Uh, next slide. So I thank you very much for having me and I hope I was useful. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sari, for this uh, nice summary and wrap up of the complications or intradialytic complications and uh, really very helpful and very practical. Uh, we can open the question for the floor. Anyone who has a question, please write it in the chat box and uh, I will read it uh, for Dr. Sari. Till uh, they write their question, Dr. Sari, I have a question for you. What is the dose of midodrine uh, you use uh, for treatment of uh, intradialytic hypotension? Um, we tend to use the 2.5 milligrams. Uh, you can use it. Uh, some people use five, but I don't. I tend to use just 2.5 because of the side effects of vasoconstriction. You could trigger angina, um, and you could trigger ischemia of you know your fingers. So, but it's 2.5 is usually the dose I use. At 2.5, you give it uh, before the hemodialysis session itself? Yes. Okay. Uh, so do we have any questions in the chat box? Anyone, ha anyone has uh, any question, please write in the chat box. Okay, the, we don't have question, but I, I want to, to ask you Okay, we have one question. Many patients with intradiuretic hypotension and uh, we do all measures that mentioned, but is still hypotensive. What do you think will be the next step, Dr. Seri? So you're right. Sometimes, you know, we think we know everything, but sometimes it doesn't work. I think these patients are the ones we would all agree have a very poor heart function. I think these are the ones we struggle with who have a poor ejection fraction. Um, mm. At that point, if their blood pressure is still too low, dangerously low, and there are a lot of other comorbidities, then we should start discussing conservative management. If we think that on a balance, carrying on dialysis is putting the patient's life at risk. Okay, we have Dr. Olive who want uh, to explain why, why give intravenous fluids in the question that you saw it. I asked you to unmute yourself, Dr. Olive. You can uh, explain now why we give intravenous fluids for that patient. 
Uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity and thanks, Doctor, for the presentation. Uh, according to the scenario given, when we look at the weight, if you could kindly share the, the, the slide, uh, the, uh, the pre-dialysis weight was uh, the difference between the pre-dialysis weight and uh, vis-a-vis -vis what was removed, the difference was uh, the patient had added on five, 500 meals of so instead of removing, as the doctor prescribed uh, removal of three liters of fluid, instead of removing 500 mils or 0 0.5 liters. Yeah, yeah. So when we look at our pre-dialysis weight it was 62 kgs and target weight, the patient's target weight is 61.5 kgs. And yet ultrafiltration done is three, Uh, already, yeah. uh, that is an extra, uh, an extra two point five mils or zero point five liters. That will do my potential, but just by going with this scenario. Yes, that's what I could say. S so in, in the in the event in the mm -hmm. event that in mm -hmm. the event that the patient becomes hypotensive, mm -hmm. the first the first uh, personal hemodialysis now. So the first uh, measure we take is put the patient, you can put the patient in a transient bag position and then infuse fluids as well. That's if your bed is able to put the patient into that position, but we could use pillows, raise the legs up and assume that position. And then also infuse fluids to replace what has been removed, which was not meant to be removed from the first. Well done. Thank you for a very thorough explanation. That's Thank you. very, very well explained. Thank you very, very much. Okay, we have more questions. Uh, if there is heparin related itching, is there indication to use heparin alternatives or not? Sorry, could you repeat the question? If there is heparin related itching? Yes. Okay. Is uh, this an indication to use heparin alternatives? Oh, yes, of course, mm. uh, you could use heparin alternatives. Um, definitely, you wouldn't want, because now we know the cause. So you would always try to use alternatives. Yes. Uh, why we are using a placil? Because some patient, old age, any alternative? Can you get this question, Dr. Seri? Um, I apologize. Uh, what is Placil? Because I don't, we tend to use the Placil. So it, can you help me by telling me what, what group of medication is that? I think Placil, this is, Placil uh, is metoclo, metoclopramide. Hello? Can you hear me, Sally? Hello? Sorry. Sally. Placil oh, is metoclopramide. Yes. So now I can hear you. So what? He is. Uh, he is saying. So what that, was the question? He, he, he said that they are not using it in old age patients. Old age patients. Because so, you're worried about extra pyramidal side yeah, effects. Yes. Yeah, so, why? so what is the alternative? You could use um, the other stuff: the ondansterone, uh, cyclizine. So any antiemetic can be used. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another question, patient on hemodialysis with carvidilol, 25, uh, twice per day, uh, erastapexco, erastapexco is a combination of antihypertensive medications, uh, aldomet, uh, and, uh, sorry, but still increase on hemodialysis, it means increased blood pressure in hemodialysis and at night before hemodialysis. Okay. The I think the first... On multiple antihypertensive medications. Uh, Erastapex is a combination of amlodipine and uh, olmizartan. Okay. 
uh, and on carvedolol and also on uh, what is called uh, aldomet aldomet here in egypt uh, it is one of the uh, also uh, anti hypermethyl doba yeah. anti hypertensive medication what is the next step and the patient still has high blood pressure so i think the next step is to actually go back and think um wh why is the patient hypertensive because um in, in, in my experience, when, when you smash patients with so many blood pressure tablets, especially the dialysis ones, and they don't respond, I think then we could blame the fluid status. So I'm not saying it's 100% correct, but it's a very, very high likely chance that this patient is fluid overloaded and he will be in, you know, gaining more weight between sessions. If that's the case, blood pressure tablets none of the blood pressure tablets you mentioned will get rid of the fluid so if the high blood pressure is not responding to all these medications then probably we should try and increase uf by prolonging the hours maybe or offering more sessions so again we would like to remove the fluids but not abruptly uh, over longer hours of dialysis um you always you know like home dialysis patients for example when they dialyze every every night every day uh you know taking one or two days off their fluid balance is much much uh, better controlled compared to people who come for three times conventional dialysis in hospital so i would say there's a very high chance that it is a fluid problem um on another note if the patient has a residual kidney function so they still pass urine which I think in this case would be unlikely, probably uh, this patient is not passing any urine. Uh, we would use more fruzamide to get rid of the fluid as well. Diet advice, low salt diet, and uh, we could also use bioimpedance machine as a guidance. I hope I answered the question. Yes, yes, perfect. Another, questions about, about, another question about your experience about sertraline. Is it efficient or not? Well, I must say that I've not specifically used sertraline for itching, but I did notice a couple of patients. Uh, when I learned about sertraline, then I started to monitor itching in patients who are already on sertraline. And as we all know, most dialysis patients are on antidepressants. Yes. Um, I could suggest a, a paper here that I've read it was a random, randomized crossover clinical trial of sertraline for intradialytic hypotension uh, in a kidney uh, international. I think it was in July 2015. Um, I can, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm unable to share, you know, the slide, but it does show as a conclusion that sertraline therapy significantly increases um, the intradialysis and post-dialysis blood pressure. Uh, so it looks like it is, uh, it does have, you know, it does have a benefit, but again, it's something new and I'm sure that not all, pa all patients will benefit from sertraline depending on comorbidities, especially, you know, like if someone is, is diabetic. Uh, I don't think they will benefit from sertraline because they lost their autonomic uh, neuropathy. Um, I'm just trying to think of any other papers. Uh, I think there was one as well published in 2019 or 2020 from my memory. Um, and again, it looks into the effects of sertraline in the prevention of low blood pressure in patients. Um, as far as I remember, it suggested that it may be beneficial, um, but again, on another note, it said there was no statistical significant difference. Uh, you've got nothing to lose, uh, doctor, by trying it, um, but the, you know, there's still we need to do probably more studies about it. Yes. Another question about clinical case: a patient with intradialytic uh, hypertension. Blood pressure 210 over 99 after 15 minutes of hemodialysis. And when we give him Adalat, Adalat is, is a knife dibine, okay. 
-hmm. there is a severe drop uh, in blood pressure to uh, 120 over 65. Okay. What is your comment on this case? I think I need to know more information about yes. the patient because mm. that's not sufficient. Um, I think, and then on another note, this is a too big drop in the blood pressure. I think it's dangerous to drop anyone's blood pressure that fast. Mm. Uh, mm. They could um, get convulsions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm. Um, I just think we need more information about the dry weight, his fluid balance, pre-dialysis, mm. blood pressure. Uh, so maybe if you can give us more information, doctor, we could, you know, open the chat and. Okay. Some patients uh, show systolic blood pressure 90 or less without symptoms. Uh, thus, this uh, considered as uh, intradiuretic hypotension. This is why going back to my slides, I hope you don't mind uh, going back to my slide. Uh, First Dr. slide. Okay. I think it's the third or fourth. Yes. Um, thank you for the question. And the answer is in this slide. I did say that I support the renal association definition, which actually says, what is an intradialytic hypotension? So basically it is the blood pressure that makes the patient symptomatic. If you naturally have a low blood pressure, you get used to it. So according to one doctor, 90 is low. According to another doctor and another guideline, this is not low. There's no hard and fast, but my personal opinion is that if you have a low blood pressure that is 100, for example, and you're suffering with headache, nausea, vomiting, you feel very lethargic, then this is too low for you. We know that lots of patients, especially the ones with heart failure, are alive, they have no symptoms, with even blood pressures of 90 and 80 systolic. Um, yeah. So it's very impressive, but probably they get used to it. Your brain gets used to it. Okay. Another question. Patient uh, develop, uh, develops a frequent attack, chest tightness and sweating and low blood pressure. His cardiac evaluation is normal. They use uh, biocompatible membrane and the priming by 2.5 liter. What is your advice regarding these frequent attacks of chest tightness, sweating, low blood pressure, although the cardiac ev evaluation is normal? So are we sure about water contamination? Are we sure that we are meeting the, um, you know, the cleanliness, the dialysate? I, I would look into the dialysate contamination. I'd look into the water purification. Um, because it's definitely related to the session, isn't it? He's not having this outside the session. So if the heart is strong enough and I've done my best to find a biocompatible membrane, then I should think about the dialysate and I should think about water contamination. I mean, I think even in UK, although we do our best to have a good, you know, water purification, but if you test it, it's not meeting the guidelines. Mm. Uh, so it's not perfect anywhere. Uh, and that patient might be suffering from that. Okay. Uh, the next one is when I can safely discharge a patient with high uh, blood pressure from the dialysis unit, what level of blood pressure can safely discharge a patient? Oh, I love that question. Dr. Gawad, what do you think? Do we, do we know? Do we have no, a no? We don't. We don't have a cut. Uh, a cut level. We don't. Yeah. I no, think it relies, but but it is a very very good question actually because um, sometimes you look at a patient and you say, okay, send him home if his systolic blood pressure is one sixty. Sometimes you say, oh, I'm happy with one eighty, and it all depends that like you knowing the patient because yeah. one sixty is high, one eighty is high, but I think. Um, just like a random rule, look at previous blood pressures, look at all the pre and post dialysis blood pressures, uh, give him sort of a treatment after dialysis, but not immediately, just wait until sort of his 
circulation settles. Um, and maybe what I do is sometimes if I'm not very happy and I'm really worried, I still admit them sometimes just for 24 hours just to make sure that, you know, they're, they're okay. So it really depends on how brave you are, uh, but there is no number. Okay, uh, another question, how about adding, adding a diuretics? Uh, yeah, I think, diuretics. Uh, I think this is important uh, at least to uh, maintain or to preserve the residual renal function of the patient if she or he uh, has a residual renal function, right? Yes, if you have a residual renal function, the best thing is to get urine from your own kidney because nothing is like the own GFR, EGFR of the kidney itself. Yes. Concerning hypertension, what about adding a spironolactone if the patient already near the aovolemic uh, state? Uh, spironolactone. So it depends. So spironolactone is there. There's um, there's evidence. It's it's actually. Uh, it's it's very useful, but yes. it depends on the potassium level as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Finrerone, uh, all these aldosterone antagonists. There's a you know lots of papers. I can share one. Let me see if I can share my slide because there was a very interesting. Uh, one second, please. So um, I think, yeah, uh, in 2020, New England Journal of Medicine, there is the fenrenone in CKD patients. Uh, so basically, they're not dialysis patients. They were C CKD patients. So I don't think there was a like direct study done with spironolactone and dialysis patients. Uh, please correct me if I'm long, wrong, Dr. Gawad. I, I, uh, I usually, well, for, from my knowledge, the uh, spironolactone can be used or it is advised to be used in patients with resistant hypertension on hemodialysis as, a, as a, one of the last lines. Yes, uh, because we worry about potassium. Uh, yes. So, yeah, I, we don't commonly use it, but obviously the heart doctors and the liver doctors uh, love using it. I, uh, I personally get worried about potassium. The last question, using the bioimpedance device. Yeah. When uh, do we say patient is overhydrated or moderately hydrated? Oh, bless you. This is a so if you look at the bioimpedance machine, it's um it just tells you. So it says plus 0.5. That means half a liter. Uh, plus one, plus two. So the machine itself tells you, and then uh, sometimes you can print a script and it tells you where the fluid is exactly. Sometimes it says in the abdomen. Sometimes it says in the legs. Um, but I wouldn't really rely on it completely. It is a good guide, but your clinical sense is much better. So, so the report of the machine will tell us uh, how much fluid uh, are yes. more than normal in this patient. Yes, it will tell you exactly. It says yes. plus or minus, and then there's a number. Okay. So uh, that uh, was uh, the last question. Again, I I'm thanking you. Uh, uh, Dr. Olive, again, want to explain uh, uh, something about uh, fluid control. Yes, you can have the mic, Dr. Olive. Uh, thank you once again uh, here in Uganda. Um, so uh, I would please correct me if I'm wrong, but some of the some of the things that I have been able to do to help patients control fluid is. I normally tend to take a look at the patient as an individual. So regardless of whether the patient is new on dialysis or continuing patient, the assessment has always got to continue, whether in the hospital or at home. And the simplest one that they can do at home is measurement of their urine. They are 24 hour urine. Why measure the urine 24 hours? This helps us to limit them because they get to know that if a patient has been able to pass 500 mils of urine in 24 hours so should that that is the amount the patient should drink in the next 24 hours because it means that the person's kidneys are able to only handle or only eliminate 500 mils of course it is not constant 
it can always change depending on whether the patient is improving or declining. So that's, that's why I'm saying the assessment has got to always continue. Kindly correct me, can subtract or add. Thank you very much. I think these are very uh, good clinical tips that you mentioned, Dr. Olive. If it is uh, possible for the patient to always assess his urine a good daily, I think this uh, may be the best uh, way to know uh, how much fluid uh, he or she must take uh, to avoid over overhydration and to be zero balanced. I, I think that right, Dr. Seri? Yeah, I agree with you. It was all, all useful tips you shared with us. Thank you very okay. much. Uh, again, uh, I thank you, Dr. Sally, and all the attendees, attendees are thanking are thanking you in the chat box. Thank uh, you very much. Thank you, and I always and I am also thanking all the attendees for attending attending this lecture and sharing their experience and the questions in the chat box. Uh, yes, we will share the slide and the the recording of the uh, lecture itself on NephroTube YouTube channel. I and I will share the link on uh, WhatsApp group and everywhere on the social media. Thank you again and see you in the next coming NephroTube webinar. Thank you and goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.